Welcome back to our 13th read aloud of wonder. I thought I'd try something a little bit different. I'm just, so I brought home the document camera, so I thought I would try that. So if we open the book, there's the bookmark. We're on a new section of wonder that's being told from Via's point of view. So uh, here's the song quote, which is from David Bowie's Space Oddity. For above the world, planet Earth is blue, and there's nothing I can do. So again, this is being told from Via's point of view, Augie's sister. So she's the one telling the story. Okay. So this chapter is called A Tour of the Galaxy. August is the sun. Me and mom and dad are planets orbiting the sun. The rest of our family and friends are asteroids and comets floating around the planets orbiting the sun. The only celestial body that doesn't orbit August, the sun, is Daisy the dog. And that's only because, to her little doggy eyes, August's face doesn't look very different from any other human's face. To Daisy, all our faces look alike, as flat and pale as the moon. I'm used to the way this universe works. I've never minded it because it's all I've ever known. I've always understood that August is special and has special needs. If I was playing too loudly and he was trying to take a nap, I knew I would have to play something else because he needed his rest after some procedure or other had left him weak and in pain. If I wanted mom and dad to watch me play soccer, I knew that nine out of 10 times they'd miss it because they were busy shuttling August to speech therapy or physical therapy or a new specialist or a surgery. Mom and dad would always say I was the most understanding little girl in the world. I don't know about that. Just that I understood there was no point in complaining. I've seen August after his surgeries, his little face bandaged, bandaged up and swollen, his tiny body full of IVs and tubes to keep him alive. After you've seen someone else going through that, it feels kind of crazy to complain about not getting the toy you'd asked for or your, or your mom missing a school play. I knew this even when I was six years old. No one ever told it to me. I just knew it. So I've gotten used to not complaining, and I've gotten used to not bothering mom and dad with little stuff. I've gotten used to figuring things out on my own, how to put toys together, how to organize my life, so I don't miss friends' birthday parties, how to stay on top of my schoolwork so I never fall behind in class. I've never asked for help with my homework, never needed reminding to finish a project or study for a test. If I was having trouble with a subject in school, I'd go home and study it until I figured it out on my own. I taught myself how to convert fractions into decimal points by going online. I've done every school project pretty much by myself. When mom and dad ask me how things are going in school, I've always said, good, even when it hasn't always been so good. My worst day, worst fall, worst headache, worst bruise, worst cramp, worst mean thing anyone could say has always been nothing compared to what August has gone through. This isn't me being noble, by the way. It's just the way I know it is. And this is the way it's always been for me for the little universe of us. But this year, there seems to be a shift in the cosmos. The galaxy is changing. Planets are falling out of alignment. Next chapter, before August. I honestly don't remember my life before August came into it. I look at pictures of me as a baby, and I see mom and dad smiling so happily, holding me. I can't believe how much younger they looked back then. Dad was this hipster dude, and Mom was this cute Brazilian fashionista. There's one shot of me at my third birthday. Dad's right behind me, right behind me while Mom's holding the cake with three lit candles. And in back of us are Tata and Papa, Grand's Uncle Ben, Aunt Kate and Uncle Poe. Everyone's looking at me, and I'm looking at the cake. You can see in that picture how I really was the first child, first grandchild, first niece, I don't remember what it felt like, of course, but I can see it in pl as plain as can be in the pictures. I don't remember the day they brought August home from the hospital. I don't remember what I said or did or felt when I saw him for the first time, though everyone has a story about it. Apparently, I just looked at him for a long time without saying anything at all. And then, finally, I said, 
It doesn't look like Lily. That was the name of a doll Grands had given me when mom was pregnant so I could practice being a big sister. It was one of those dolls that are incredibly lifelike and I had carried it everywhere for months, changing its diaper, feeding it. I'm told I even made a baby sling for it. The story goes that after my initial reaction to August, it only took a few minutes, according to Grands, or a few days, according to Mom, before it was all over. Before I was all over him, kissing him, cuddling him, baby talking to him. After that, I never so much as touched or mentioned Lily again. Next chapter: Seeing August. I never used to see August the way other people saw him. I knew he didn't look exactly normal but I really didn't understand why strangers seemed so shocked when they saw him. Horrified, sickened, scared. There are so many words I can use to describe the looks on people's faces. And for a long time, I didn't get it. I'd just get mad, mad when they stared, mad when they looked away. What the heck are you looking at? I'd say to people, even grown-ups. Then when I was about 11, I went to stay with Grands in Montauk for four weeks while August was having his big jaw surgery. This was the longest I'd ever been away from home. And I have to say, it was so amazing to suddenly be free of all that stuff that made me so mad. No one stared at Grands and me when we went into town to buy groceries. No one pointed at us. No one even noticed us. Grands was one of those grandmothers who do everything with their grandkids. She'd run into the ocean if I asked her to, even if she had nice clothes on. She would let me play with her makeup and didn't mind if I used it on her face to practice my face painting skills. She'd take me for ice cream, even if we hadn't eaten dinner yet. She'd draw chalk horses on the sidewalk in front of her house. One night, while we were walking back to town, walking back from town, I told her that I wished I could live with her forever. I was so happy there. I think it might have been the best time in my life. Coming home after four weeks felt very strange at first. I remember very vividly stepping through the door and seeing August running over to welcome me home. And for this tiny fraction of a moment, I saw him not the way I've always seen him, but the way other people see him. It was only a flash, an instant, while he was hugging me, so happy that I was home but it surprised me because I'd never seen him like that before. And I'd never felt what I was feeling before either. A feeling I hated myself for having the moment I had it. But as he was kissing me with all his heart, all I could see was the drool coming down his chin. And suddenly there I was like all those people who would stare or look away, horrified, sickened, scared. Thankfully that only lasted for a second. The moment I heard August laugh his raspy little laugh, it was over. Everything was back the way it had been before. But it had opened a door for me, a little peephole. And on the other side of the peephole, there were two Augusts. One I saw blindly, and the other one other people saw. I think the only person in the world I could have told any of this to was Grands, but I didn't. It was too hard to explain over the phone. I thought maybe when she came for Thanksgiving, I'd tell her what I felt. But just two months after I stayed with her in Montauk, my beautiful grands died. It was so completely out of the blue. Apparently, she had checked herself into the hospital because she'd been feeling nauseous. Mom and I drove out to see her, but it's a three-hour drive from where we live, and by the time we got to the hospital, grands was gone. A heart attack, they told us, just like that. It's so strange how one day you can be on this earth and the next day not. Where did she go? Will I ever see her again? Or is that a fairy tale? You see movies and TV shows where people receive horrible news in hospitals. But for us, with all of our many trips to the hospital with August, there had always been good outcomes. What I remember the most from the day Grands died is mom literally crumpling to the floor in slow heaving sobs holding her stomach like someone had just punched her. I never ever, I'd never ever seen mom like that. Never heard sounds like that come out of her. Even though all, even through all of August's surgeries, mom always put on a brave face. On my last day in Montauk, Grands and I had watched the sunset on the beach. We'd taken a blanket to sit on, 
but it had gotten chilly, so we wrapped it around us and cuddled and talked until there wasn't even a sliver of sun left over the ocean. And then, Grans told me she had a secret to tell me. She loved me more than anyone else in the world. Even August? I had asked. She smiled and stroked my hair like she was thinking about what to say. I love Augie very, very much, she said softly. I can still remember her Portuguese accent, the way she rolled her R's. But he has many angels looking out for him already, Pia. And I want you to know that you have me looking out for you. Okay, Menina. Menina Quer Quer Querida? I want you to know that you are number one for me. You are my... She looked out at the ocean and spread her hands out like she was trying to smooth out the waves. You are my everything. You understand me, Via? Tu es me tudo. I understood her, and I knew why she said it was a secret. Grandmothers aren't supposed to have favorites. Everyone knows that. But after she died, I held on to that secret and let it cover me like a blanket. Okay, tomorrow we will read the next chapter, which is August Through the Peephole. So thank you for watching, and I will see you tomorrow.